All right, good morning. This is screencast, uh, I think it's screencast four, for unit two, lesson two, and I am on page 94. Okay, um, I'm looking at the blue heading that says, what tools do scientists use to make measurements? Choosing the appropriate tool to make measurements is an important part of a successful scientific investigation, and there are many scientific tools available. Knowing which tool to use depends on the type of measurement that you need. For example, timing devices such as clocks or stopwatches measure periods of time. A thermometer measures temperature. There are many types of balances used to measure mass, including pan balances, triple beam balances, and electronic balances. Psychrometers and anemometers are used to measure various weather conditions. So we're going to talk about several um, types of tools today. Remember, we are reviewing lab equipment right now, so this is probably a, a good time to talk about some of these. So, page 94, obviously a stopwatch measures the period of elapsed time for a specific event. What you do is you start it and then stop it and look at the time that's elapsed, okay? Um, if you look at the stopwatch on um, page 94, and you timed something, then what happened with this stopwatch is one minute and 37 seconds went by and 51 one hundredths of a second, okay? Um, so if you want to convert the value shown on the stopwatch in seconds, well, there are 60 seconds in a minute plus 37 more seconds. So 60 plus 37, I guess is 97 seconds, 97.51 seconds, okay? All right, thermometers measure temperature. Some thermometers have liquids inside them that expand and contract in response to changes in temperatures. Um, the ones that we use typically in the lab, the bulb of the thermometer has some sort of red liquid in it, and it's actually um, alcohol. It's an alcohol thermometer, okay? Um, if you see a thermometer with a silver bulb, that's probably a mercury thermometer. They're a little bit more accurate, but mercury is... Um, hazardous material, so if the thermometer breaks, we've um, got a hazardous material to, to deal with. So those are less common these days, um, but they're still in use, and you can still still get those. Okay. What is the SI temperature shown on the thermometer? The SI temperature is actually Kelvin, remember, but we normally do not measure much in here, at least yet, in Kelvin, so we're probably going to use the Celsius scale. Okay. Um, a lot of the thermometers that we have in the lab have Celsius and Fahrenheit on them. Okay. 94, down at the bottom, a pan balance. Now, we don't have a pan balance in the lab, but we could use a pan balance to figure out an unknown mass. You put the unknown mass in one pan, and then you have to add weights to the other pan. It's kind of like a seesaw. When the pans are level, then the weights on in each pan is equal. So you can add weights to determine what, um, what the mass of that object is. Okay? Okay, on page 95, the first thing that we look at is a psychrometer. A psychrometer measures relative humidity, which is the amount of moisture in the air compared to the amount of moisture that the air could hold at that temperature. Okay? Measurements from a psychrometer can be analyzed using a psychrometric chart to basically a psychrometer has two thermometers on it. One thermometer bulb we're going to keep dry and the other thermometer bulb we're going to soak um, because we're going to cover it with a wet cloth. And then what you do, most of your psychrometers that we'll use in the lab are sling psychrometers because you're literally going to sling them around. And when you do that, the uh, water evaporates from that cloth surrounding that, that one bulb that's wet, and um, how much moisture is in the air sort of determines how much of that water is going to evaporate. And because evaporation is actually a cooling process, it actually steals heat and is going to lower the thermometer reading um, of that particular wet bulb thermometer. Okay, so that thermometer reading will will drop and it will read something lower than the dry bulb thermometer will read. 
Okay, and then we use the this, those two temperatures and we refer to a chart and figure out the relative humidity um, from the difference in those two temperatures. Okay, spring scale. Spring scale uh, measures weight. Remember, weight and mass are not the same. We use a pan balance or a triple beam balance or an electronic balance um, to measure mass, but we're going to use a spring scale to measure weight. Okay. All right, down at the bottom of page 95, there is a picture of an anemometer. Okay, an anemometer is a tool that measures wind speed. Okay, there are two types of anemometers. There's a cup anemometer and a windmill-like anemometer with like little propeller-looking things that spin. Okay, so the windmill anemometer has a propeller that rotates. Okay, wind speed is measured by recording how fast the propeller rotates. So this one on this page on 95 is a windmill anemometer. Okay, I'm going to flip over to page 97. That right there, you see the little cups, that is a cup anemometer. Okay. All right, we're going to duck over to page 97 for just a second. All right, I'm on page 97. What tools do scientists use to analyze data? Data are useful to show correlations between things, you know, meaning how are two variables related. Scientists analyze data to determine the effects of changes in variables. Simple analyses, such as identifying trends in a table or chart, are often done manually in a notebook or journal used to record the data. Calculators speed up calculations and help ensure accuracy of experimental analysis. And in many experiments, computers handle the analysis of quantitative data. Charts, graphs, and models can be built based on recorded data. Many scientific instruments record data directly into a computer where it can be analyzed and a report prepared. So a lot of the tools that we use these days, um, not so much in the eighth grade lab, but you know, professional level tools um, are digital and they dump their information directly into, co into a computer. Okay. All right, I'm now on page 98 and 99. What tools do scientists use to conduct investigation? investigations. Okay, We have two types of tools basically. We have tools that manipulate materials and we have tools that manipulate data. Okay, So let's talk about tools that ma manipulate materials first. Okay, Studying a material or object often involves changing it in some way. Choosing the right tool to manipulate or change a material or object is an important part of any investigation. For example, beakers can be used to hold liquids for stirring, mixing, and heating. A hot plate transfers heat to the contents of a beaker. Test tubes are useful for containing materials as they are heated. Petri dishes can be used to make cell cultures. A light microscope and slides can be used to view small objects, etc. Okay, so those are all tools that we can use to manipulate things um, and look at them and make observations. And then we have other tools that uh, will manipulate data. Okay. In many investigations, very large sets of data must be analyzed. You've got a lot of stuff to look at. The results are often represented as physical models or computer simulations. Computers allow scientists to collect, record, and analyze very large sets of data in a short time. Spreadsheet programs, like um, you're probably familiar with um, Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel, those are spreadsheet programs. Spreadsheet programs organize the data into large tables and perform calculations automatically. Digital cameras can provide a visual record of events. They can record changes that occur very rapidly. These cameras can also record data about events that take place in harsh or inaccessible environments. For example, cameras attached to telescopes or microscopes can record objects too far away or too small to observe directly. They're also able to record information using wavelengths that are not visible to the human eyes. Digital cameras record images as files of data based on numbers, and this means that the data can be loaded directly into a computer and used in calculations. Okay, we have a couple of um, pieces of um, lab equipment that you may not be quite so familiar with. 
Okay. We've talked about test tubes, so she's holding a test tube on page 98. Then we've got somebody using a hot plate with a beaker on it that's being heated on page 98. Then we have a young man using a spectroscope. A spectroscope actually takes light and breaks it up into the visible spectrum. And it will show you certain areas where um, certain wavelengths of light are either being emitted or absorbed. Okay. Also, a microscope is shown on page 99. A microscope magnifies an image and makes it easier to see details of small structures, such as cells in a leaf. Okay, so that's just kind of an overview. This is a review of some of the lab equipment that you might come across and what we do with it. That should wrap up Lesson 2. Um, so the rest of it, I haven't highlighted anything. I've just gone over it, but that's your job to do is to go back, starting at number 1 on page 89, starting here, and you need to make sure that you are doing all of the numbered items that you come across for the act of reading. You also need to do the lesson review. Okay.